Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Welcome to this segment of Lessons from the Playroom, where today we're going to be exploring boundaries in the playroom. How to set them, when to set them, why we set them, is it important to set them, are just going to be a few of the topics that we're going to address in the next 30 minutes. I also have with me a live studio audience as we explore this topic. So from time to time, the audience members will ask questions and we will get to interact together throughout the show. So I'm going to address this um, coming from the standpoint of using a non-directive model first. And then I will talk about boundaries in the context of a directive model of play therapy. I, I think inherent in directive model, there's, there's an inherent boundary sort of there in the directive process. And it's a little more complicated when it's a non-directive style where the child's in charge and the child's taking the lead. So I want to say from the beginning that play therapy, the play therapy experience is not a free-for-all. There are boundaries, and it is important to know exactly when to set them and why to set them. And it's really the understanding of the boundary itself and why it's used that will help you really be able to assess in any given moment, is this the time to use it? Because setting a boundary is very much an intuitive process. Now, there are many play therapists out there that may disagree with that and may come from a background that has training that says, you know, it's important to outline the boundaries right up front and that there are certain rules that the child must follow. And if the child doesn't follow these rules or this certain level of respect that doesn't occur in the room, then there are, I'm going to use our consequences, although not in a punishment kind of a way, but there are certain things that would happen such as finishing the session early or, um, you know, trying in some way to uh, have a teachable moment with the child when the boundary is crossed. And I'm not coming from that standpoint. And that is really a personal experience um, that has led to that or personal experiences in that I found that when I initially would walk into a room and I would set boundaries like, you know, this is the playroom and this is your opportunity and your time to play how you need to and explore how you need to. And there's three rules. You know, you're not going to get hurt. I'm not going to get hurt, and the toys aren't going to get hurt. What I found was immediately I would get tested. It was almost like that then became part of the, the process was, what do I do with that information? <laughs> what do I do with the fact that I was just told in the same sentence that this is my place to explore how I need to explore, yet... I have, I, there's these like limits and, and the limits themselves are, they seem clear, but I'm not so sure. So where, where is that line? And so I found that once I stopped doing that, the need to set boundaries drastically actually decreased. So when I outlined rules at the beginning, the need for the boundaries went up. And when I stopped and I trusted that if something arises in the play and I need to, I will handle it in the moment, that all of a sudden it went down. The other piece that I think is really significant as play therapists is that I really want a child to understand that they really can work through whatever they need to work through. Now, what happens if what a child is trying to explore is bullying, let's just say? How are they going to process bullying 
unless they can somehow energetically hurt the therapist or hurt the toys. H- how are they going to go there? And so there's a, um, just in the act of setting the rules, we might be limiting and giving them a message sort of, um, Uh, not necessarily overtly, but giving them that subtle message of, you know what, there are things in this room or areas or experiences or emotions that we're not actually going to be able to get into. And so that's something to consider. Now, some play therapists say, yeah, but kids need boundaries. You're right, outside of the playroom. Absolutely. So when we're working with parents, when we're working with teachers, when we're working with um, people who are in a different type of relationship with the child, absolutely we're coaching them and working with them on setting boundaries and, and how to do that. And, and when I say boundaries in that context, I'm really talking about rules. There are rules in a home. There are rules you know, in, in relationships, so to speak. But play therapy needs to be the one place where they get to explore everything that they get in trouble for. It needs to be the one place where they can be as messy as they need to be on an emotional level, that they get to dive in and explore all the different nuances and feelings and experiences and and messages and, and all that stuff that is bottled up inside that they're getting feedback from their outer world that it's not okay. And if we step into that role too, Again, we're potentially, I'm not saying we're doing it 100% of the time, but we're potentially limiting an area of exploration for the child. So it's just something to consider. So from my perspective, because the playroom is really about the child going where they need to go, boundaries in the playroom are not for the child. They're for the therapist. Play therapy, from my perspective, is not behavior modification training. You know, if if the child is needing that, put them in a group. You know, have that be a focused group for the child. Or one of the things that I love in combination is I'll go into the playroom and I'm working from I'm working on helping the child really process through the really hard emotional stuff. And then so that the child also gets the 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 the, uh, the understanding of okay, well what do you do with this energy in the world? Because let's be honest, there is some social norming that we do all need to adhere to to be able to function and flow through life. And that can be a piece that you delegate to the parents. So in the session, we explored anger and aggression. And let's talk about right how you can help him understand appropriate ways of doing it outside of the play therapy room. So that's a really cool way to actually set the parent up to be a conscious teacher, if you will. So in the room itself, the boundaries are for the therapist, not the child. And what I mean by that is that the moment that we need to set a boundary is the moment when we know that if the child were to do whatever they're doing one more time or in a little bit more of an intense way, um, we're probably going to check out. So the boundary is there to help us be present. The boundary is there as a tool for us to be able to stay in relationship and to stay in connection with the child. So one of the ways to do this is, from this perspective, is to really work at avoiding using the word no. No, you know, we can't do that. I'm not for hitting. Because those are very boom, right? The moment we say no to the child, because the child isn't actually trying to hurt you. The child is trying to set you up to feel how they feel. And you're, you're in the midst of the play. And so if all of a sudden you turn around and slam your foot down, so to speak, and say, no, we cannot do this, you've actually energetically just made the child the perpetrator. That's something to really sink into. And the child wasn't trying to be a perpetrator energetically in the sense of being a bad guy. They were just trying to get you to understand. And so it can be very disorienting for the child to all of a sudden be told the no. And so one of the ways of working with this is um, empathizing with the child around the need for the expression and then redirecting it. So a common place this shows up is in sword fighting. Sword fighting is a place where intensity can occur really quickly. 
So for me, one of the areas of sensitivity that I'm aware of in my own body is I have some sensory issues, particularly around things coming quickly at my head. And so I have a higher probability of setting a boundary in a sword fight if the sword starts getting swung at my head because I get disoriented really quickly. I have a hard time just processing that. I get flooded really easily. And so if, let's say in the play, we're having a sword fight, and let's say that it's it's pretty obvious that what's emerging in the sword fight itself is that the child is trying to take my power away. The child's trying to get me to experience overwhelm. I've lost my power. I'm helpless. But a real sense of, of overwhelm in all of it. The first thing that I would want to do is um, I want to actually change the tone of my voice because I've seen therapists do this where they attempt to set a boundary, but they still do it in the energy of the play, and the child thinks they're still playing. They think that what they're saying is just still part of the play. They don't understand that, that this is different. Something different has just occurred. So, you know, if I'm, you know, in the play and, um, Uh, you know, and I'm overwhelmed and this is scary, I'm going to come out of the play, hey, Mike, right? Different energy, different voice, hey, Mike. And I'm going to try to make eye contact so that they know that something serious is happening. Hey, Mike, I get it. This is so overwhelming. I get it. I get it. Show me another way. And so it's, it's just being able to find a way to empathize. Or I get it. You need me to understand this. Show me another way. I can understand a different way. So you're not stopping, and and you're going to find the words that best suit you, and I guarantee the words that come out of your mouth will be different every time you set the boundary. Um, But the idea is that you you don't want to stop the expression. You want to acknowledge the need for the expression, and then you want to redirect. This is really challenging if we're not present from the beginning. Um, If we're not regulating ourselves in the process, we're going to get flooded really easily. And when we get flooded, because of the way our brains naturally work, we are naturally going to go into some type of a fight or flight freeze response. So if I'm not regulating myself well, and then all of a sudden a sword fight emerges in the playroom, and I'm like, I can't even handle this, I'm just so flooded... I'm probably going to hit my threshold quicker, and I have a higher probability of saying no, st- not stop, no, done, can't handle this. We're not playing this anymore, which I've seen therapists do. And it's, again, it's not coming from a place where the therapist is trying to control the child or be mean to the child. The therapist got scared. And when we get scared, we respond, just like they do. When they get scared, they respond. And so part of the work for us as the therapist is to do what we need to do to regulate ourselves so we don't have to hit that point and that we can actually recognize, oh, the point is coming. Here it comes. This is getting like way too much here. And then we can, while we're still present, while the energy is still in our own window of tolerance, while we can still manage it, then we set um, set the boundary from that space. Because in the, from that energy, the child intuitively knows we're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to shut them down. Um, and children will, will flow with you. They'll flow with you. They will totally try to find another way. So a couple days ago, because we'll make this um, uh, more tangible, a couple days ago I was working with a little girl, and this is a four-year-old, and it's a four-year-old that has some sensory processing issues, and she has a lot of struggle with um, sensations in her tactile system. So this is a girl where, you know, light touch feels like someone is poking needles in her arm. She's, her her um, tactile system is incredibly sensitive, and so she can only wear certain kinds of pants, Tags are annoying for her. Her her sensitivity on her body is pretty high. Well, she wants me to understand that. So in the play, she wants my body to hurt in the play. So she will take objects, and she'll take objects, and she'll come over, and she'll try to shove them in my leg, pointy things. Pointy things coming and trying to jab in my legs. Now, um, you know, my tolerance for that, okay, you know, I've got a certain threshold there that I can hang in. And every once in a while, 
there's one that really hurts. And so in the session, I found myself, it was starting to become a lot. And she really wanted me to understand another part of the sensation, which was that um, in addition to the the, the sensory input, um, she also had a, an, an event where a uh, neighbor dog uh, like just nipped her. And so for someone that didn't have sensory issues, the nip might have been a little shocking, but it wouldn't necessarily have been painful. But for her, with her tactile sensitivity, it registered as excruciating. And so she came over and wanted to try to bite me and not nip me, but wanted to bite so that I would get the actual sensation of what that felt like for her. Now, that was a place where I chose to set a boundary because I knew that is really going to hurt. That's outside of my window of tolerance. And so I looked at her and I said her name and I made eye contact with her and I said something to the effect of, my body hurts. I get it. It It's really painful. It's really painful. And I don't actually have to hurt in order to understand. So pretend and I can get it. So I just redirected it. And so she came at me with her mouth open and pretended to take a bite out of my arm, at which point I went into the experience as if she had just bit my arm. So it was just a really simple honoring that she needed to do it. I'm also not going to let her take a chunk out of my arm and inviting it, like, keep, like, do it, come at me, do it, pretend, and I'll go there with you is also another way of um, setting a boundary. So studio audience, anybody have any questions about that? Because it's a lot of, it's a lot of information to, to take in and process, but really, really important to, um, to consider. Does anybody have a question? <coughs> Are there any age differences at which this approach wouldn't work? No. Mm-hmm. I haven't found any. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I guess I'm wondering if it's appropriate for you to bring in, like, your actual feelings so you don't prefer anything, like, in your face, and that's really overwhelming for you to say, like, whoa, that's really overwhelming for me. Is that, like, hijacking the session, or is that just speaking to, like, what they're trying to get you to feel? You mean naming that in the midst of setting the boundary Mm -hmm. or you're naming that in the play itself? As you're trying to set the boundary. Um, Sure, if you have time to do that. Okay. Um, So oftentimes, like in the sword fight, you have about five seconds, Mm -hmm. ten seconds to rattle off the boundary, you know, um, before you lose the momentum and the energy of the sword fight. And so depending on what's going on in the play – because again, I don't want to stop the energy. I'm, I may or may not take the time to explain why that is or what that's about. But um, that actually brings a, a great example. So when I was pregnant, I was doing play therapy. And so I was very protective of my belly. And I wasn't, that was going to be my boundary, right? Nothing was going to come at my belly. That was, that was my boundary. And there was a kid that really wanted to go after my belly, of course. And so, you know, from, from that place, I did go into some explanation, you know. Now, this was a child who also had um, some early um, birth trauma in his history. And so, of course, he wants to attack the womb and attack the baby. And it's a way for him to get me to feel what that's like. So it was a redirection around... Like, I get it, you know, you want, you, you want my belly and there's a baby inside. So let's find another way so that I can understand this because I can go there with you. I can totally go there with you. But let's find a way to do this where the baby stays safe, you know. Um, another example of a redirection was a little boy that um, was adopted from China and he was adopted at age three, and he had some trauma in the history where um, there was definitely some neglect, and there was definitely some hints of some possible like physical abuse, like maybe being hit as a as a as an infant, small child. Well, in the play, one point he came after me, and he really wanted to go after my face. 
like really, really, really wanted to attack my face. And um, it was also, the play was also very young. And so there were other reasons why I knew this, but I knew that we were in a really early emotional um, state. We were in an infancy stage in the play. And um, he really wanted to go after my face. And when I attempted to redirect, he said, no, your face. It was really important for me to understand something that happened to the face, which is probably where he got hit. And so it wasn't um, good enough for him to hit me, let's say, from the shoulders down, because that's not where a face was. And so from that perspective, it was the... Um, uh, you know, I tried to redirect and it and it didn't work. And I looked around and there was a baby doll on the cat on, on the on the shelf. And so I grabbed the baby doll and I said, "Show me. I can get it. I can understand. I can go there." At which point he put the baby doll on the floor and he started punching the baby doll's face. So again, it, again, I want you to understand we're not shutting the energy down. It's just always about, which, let's just find another way so that I can stay present and be in relationship with you because that's what this is about. You need me here with you to do this work. You need me to hold this with you, um, and this is big stuff, and you need to do this. So let's, let's find a way that works for both of us. So that's, that's some of the gist in terms of the actual setting of the boundaries in the room. I want to um, quickly talk about some other little places around um, setting boundaries, breaking toys. So I have therapists ask me all the time, the kid broke my toys. What do I do? Do you just let the kid break the toys? It depends. Is it in your window of tolerance or not? You know, what's, what's your threshold? If a child breaks your toy, are you going to be able to be present with them the rest of the session? Because if you're going to be so mad that they broke your toy, then yeah, that's probably a place to set a boundary. Um, and again, it may be finding something else in the room that they can break or rip or something that feels more in your window of, uh, of tolerance so that you can stay present. And for some therapists, it's like, go ahead, break the toy. You know, and they're recognizing the the symbolism in that, or the significance of the toy needing to needing to be broken in that moment. Um, what's coming to mind are therapists that say, "Yeah, but then aren't you just reinforcing that it's okay to break toys?" And you're not actually. If the child needs to break something because there's something meaningful about that, or there's an emotion attached to that, and it's not explored, the child will continue to break toys until they get it and they understand it. If, however, you can support the energy coming to life and you can hold the energy and then you can help integrate the energy, you actually decrease the need to continue to break toys. It's when we don't allow the expression that the expression actually continues and when we're not present with the expression so that it can actually be integrated. And then the last piece that I'm going to talk about that therapists often bring questions around is, what about boundaries with things like sand and art? What about the kid that wants to pour all the paint out of my bottles of paint, and that's all that I have? <laughs> or the child that wants to, I just bought new Play-Doh, and they want to mix every single one of the colors together, and it's driving me bonkers. <laughs> And what I'll say is there might be an edge there for you to play with, for you to sit with what's coming up in you. And then there's also a piece of it's your room. You don't need to have that large bottle of paint in there. You could put, you can find smaller doses of paint if that's in your window of tolerance. You could buy little cups, little Dixie cups, and that part of when they go for the, for the paint, it's we're going to pour some of the paint in the little cups. I mean, there's ways that you can, again, um, have it be available in the room, but in a way that's manageable. Um, you know, with uh, Play-Doh, maybe not having all 10 colors there, you know. Um, or if you really don't care, then great. Have all 10 colors there, but just know that if it's in the room, it's up for grabs. <laughs> okay? If, you're, if, you're, if it's out there for an option, then you're basically saying, this is here for you to do with it, whatever you feel like you need to do. That's what you're doing by having the toy in the room. Um, and, uh, and then there's the questions, yeah, but what about like the gigantic messes with the paint? 
And I spoke a little bit about this on the segment on toys in the playroom. So that would be a great one to also reflect back on or to listen to. But I think that one of the essential things in every playroom is a shower curtain. And the shower curtain is used for this purpose. So if you have a child that needs to make a mess, they need to make a mess. Pull out the shower curtain, lay the shower curtain on the ground, and encourage them to go to town. Same thing with the sand. You got a kiddo that needs to get the sand out of the sandbox or needs to somehow have something explode. You've got a shower curtain there to be able to um, create some level of a boundary, but still offer the child the experience that they're looking for rather than just the sand's not allowed to come out of the sandbox because you're nervous or scared that you've got to clean it up because your next client is coming in 20 minutes. Um, find a way to allow for the expression in a way that's manageable for you so that you can support the child moving through whatever it is that they need to move through. So I'm going to ask the audience if there's a final question, and um, then we will wrap up this, um, this segment. Is there a final question? Can you speak a bit about how to repair the session when you find yourself as the therapist completely flooded and your boundaries have been stepped over? Love it. That's a great mm -hmm. question. Right, because we do this, right? We're, we, uh, we do get flooded and we do sometimes scream out no and we do those things. And so what we know about the attachment research is that the repair process is just as significant as when we got it right. And so that's a beautiful time to come back around and to actually share what happened. I got so scared. I got so scared and so overwhelmed that what came out of my mouth was no, because I didn't know what else to say. What I wish I would have said was. Mm -hmm. And you can go back and do the repair. Um, I've heard therapists do this beautifully where they know that it got intense and they know they shut the child's process down. And they come back and they own it. You know, last time when that happened and I yelled at you or I got kind of harsh with my words, I'm nervous that you're not going to want to play like that again because you're worried that I can't go there, I can't handle it. And I want you to know that I do want you to play like that again if you need to play like that again. And I will handle it in a different way. So, you know, if you feel like you shut the play down, you can reopen it with an invitation to, to play again. Just going back and doing the repair, which is beautiful and honest and um, an amazing thing to model to a child. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.